All right. Welcome to Rampart Christian Fellowship. Today is May 31st, 2015. And we are in a series of messages titled, The Struggle is Real. This is part two in, uh, in the Struggle is Real series. And today we are going to talk about the struggle of addiction. In a lot of ways that this message is the reason why Rampart Christian Fellowship exists. This is, the, in a lot of ways, this message is the reason why I am here today and I'm not in prison or, or, uh, or dead. Uh, this, uh, this, the, the truth that, we, that we're going to explore today about the, the struggle of addiction is a, a very real thing and it affects everybody, ev everybody I know. <laughs> And uh, you, you know, you may not be a person who's uh, struggling with a, with a life-disabling addiction, but you, I, I would be, be uh, I'm confident that you probably know somebody who is, because uh, there, the, it's so prevalent in our society. So, um, the struggle is very real when it comes to the topic of addictions. Uh, we are all affected by addictions. It is. Uh, is a safe is a safe estimate to say we all have some addiction that we're dealing with. So, you know, coffee, caffeine. You know, that's pretty popular. I mean, on all levels of society. Um, a simple definition of, of addiction that I you know I did some research, looked around, and this is what I came up with as a as a as an idea to define the term addiction. This is what I came up with: any substance or behavior that is done repeatedly or or continuously practiced that is elevated in priority above other areas of life. Often the terms I need, you know, fill in the blank, or I love, I fill in the blank, are used in relation to a person's addiction. You know, like, I need a cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, I, I absolutely need that. And, and so, um, there are many common addictions such, uh, such as, but not limited to. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of addictions out there. But what do we, you know, the common ones, are drugs, and those include caffeine and marijuana. You know, a lot of people argue, oh, pot's not a, dr not a drug, whatever. You know, I mean, you can deal with, <laughs> deal with the facts on that. It's a prescription item. You know, they don't prescribe stuff that's not drugs, right? I mean, I don't know. But uh, then you have alcohol, which is, you know, everybody knows about the addiction of alcoholism. It's common out there. It, it destroys so many lives. Um, food, there's so many people addicted. To, um, I myself, I'm still working through you know, like the, the, the deal with eating too many carbohydrates, you know, sugars and, and, and things like that. And um, there's addictions to sex, pornography, gambling, shopping, hoarding, which is like an addiction uh, uh, to, uh, to shopping, but, but hoarding stuff at your house. I mean, not all hoarders do, you know, get stuff at the store. They, they go and collect stuff all over the place. There's also uh, the digital addictions, I call them, computers, video games, and media. Um, and then, you know, so many people are on their phones all the time have, having to have their addiction, uh, digital fix to their thing. And, you know, it, it, there's even a thing called a, um, phone anxiety. Like if you don't know where your phone is at, you know, that's, that's becoming a thing now where people will freak out if they don't know how their thing. And then there's even addictions when it comes to, uh, things that are con pretty much con uh, considered positive, like work. Uh, you've heard of workaholics, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's an addiction to always uh, needing, you have this internal need, you need to be working. And you're, you're work, you know, I, uh, my mother-in-law, she works, you know, multiple, you know, her normal week is like 80 hours a week or something like that. <laughs> and so it's just crazy. Um, and some people are addicted to exercise. They're, they're you know, they call them uh, gym, gym hounds or something like that. They're, they're, they're always in the gym. Um, even there's even addiction to to making or saving money, and basically that's that's the equivalent of hoarding money. I mean, so you're always you know you get money, and there's people that just get money, and they have they, they want to keep it, and they want to save it, and they want they want to get more of it, and they're they're always on this pursuit for more and more money. And then the last one I put is power. You know you know you know there's people addicted to getting 
power, you know, in, in society. You know, there's people that just, that just want to be power hungry. And you don't even need to have whatever it is you're addicted to. You can be, power, you can be addicted to power and be a powerless person, but you, you have this desire inside you. You can be addicted to money and not have any money. <laughs> and you can be you know, addicted to drugs even when, you're, when you don't have any supply of what you're, what you're, what you're addicted to. And so um, there's also, I, I highlighted... Uh, the de definition of uh, uh, addiction in Wikipedia, it says addiction is a state characterized by compulsive, by compulsive um, engagement in rewarding stimuli. Yeah, pretty scientific. Um, despite adverse consequences. So regardless of the consequences, this is something that you're, that you're always compelled to do. It can be thought of as a disease or biological process leading to such behaviors. The two, the two properties that characterize all behavior, all addictive stimuli, are that they are positively reinforcing, that they increase the likelihood that a person will seek repeated exposure to them, and intrinsic, intrinsically rewarding. Uh, it's a lot of syllables, but just, just stick with me here. <laughs> uh, uh, they're addictive or they activate the brain's reward pathways. Like there's certain things you do, like smoking cigarettes or anything, that, that, that will trigger a chemical release in your brain and therefore uh, perceived as being something positive. E even though you know it's killing you, it, re it, re it releases a chemical that makes you perceive it as a positive thing. Um, and the, it says a gene uh, tra uh, transcription factor is known as a, to be a, a critical component in the common factor of the development of virtually all forms of behavioral drug addictions. It says, you know, so it, it's actually been tested to, to, to prove that it, there is a genetic portion to our, uh, it, we can be genetically uh, uh, prone to addiction. And addictions um, exacts, uh, uh, exacts a high toll on individuals and society as a whole through, through direct and adverse effects of drugs associated with healthcare costs, functional, uh, the functional consequences of altered uh, neural plasticity, plasticity in the brain and the loss of productivity. Uh, classic hallmarks of addiction include impaired control over, over substances or behavior, preoccupation with that substance or behavior, continued, or use, uh, um, continued use despite consequences, and the, the common one, denial. You know, I'm not addicted to that. I can quit any time I want. Kind of famous last words of so many addicts. Uh, habits, habits and patterns associated with addiction are typically ca characterized by immediate gratification and short-term reward. And that's a lot of time when, when, we, when we're addicted to something, we just want it now. We don't care what it costs, we want it now. And it, and it, and it costs us, you know, greatly, greatly, greatly. Um, coupled with deterior, uh, deleterious effects, I know. Currently, um, now, in the, in, the, in the world of psychology, there's this book called the DSM-5, uh, and, and that's what, they, what they basically lays down the guidelines for what psychology considers problems. And, and only, substance, uh, only substance, substance addictions and gambling addiction are recognized in the DSM-5. In psychology, they only, they only recognize drugs and gambling as, as true addiction problems, but that's in psychology. I mean, my wife you know, got her bachelor's degree in psychology, and, and she shared with me a lot of what's said in the DSM-5, and I don't agree with a lot. <laughs> I mean, just from life experiences and what I've seen, I don't always agree with what the, psycho you know, the, the organization of psychology puts out there. Um, but it's, it's up to you. you know, whatever you, you want to believe, I mean, that's your choice. I mean, we just sang a song that says, I, I believe what I believe, and that's what makes me who I am. <laughs> and, and you believe what you believe, and that's what makes you who you are. Amen? Amen. Okay. Uh, and so all that being said, uh, let's go back to the notes here. The spiritual aspect of addiction is much deeper than you might think. Um, it can have the devastating impact on a person's relationship to God. I mean, uh, it, addictions are sin. And sin is what separates uh, uh, the creation from the creator, a, a person from God. And I, I highlighted three things that, 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 that get to the core of how addiction is sin. So let's look at a few verses here. And the first thing I highlighted about addictions, they're selfish. I mean, I, I guess there is might, maybe some weird possibility that you might be addicted to something that has to do with other people, but, but, but still, I mean, it still comes from your heart. And an addiction is a self, 
self-centered thing. It's how I want something. It's a want and desire that's focused in my heart or my mind. And, and, and so it's a self-centered thing. So what is Galatians? Let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 5. And it really highlights you know, the core of, of what we're talking about today. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19. Galatians 5, 19. So in, in the book of Galatians, in this passage of scripture, actually all the way from 16 all the way to the end of 26, is a, is a very influential passage of scripture in my life. Galatians chapter 5 from 16 to 26 is, is, is core. It, it, it just lays it out plainly. This is what it looks like to live in the flesh, and then there's, there's what it looks like to live in the spirit. You know, and, and, and some people don't believe that, there's actually, that, that we are actually a trichotomy. We are mind, you know, mind, body, and spirit. You know, that's what makes up a person. You know, you have your spirit or your soul. And, and, that's, and I, I believe that your spiritual state can actually influence your mental and your physical health. And, and a lot of people will argue, oh, I don't know about that. Some people only think there's two. There's only mind and body. And they, and they completely ignore their spirit. And I tell you, I mean, and they, it, it's, it's evident in our society that that's the way people are going. They're completely denying the spiritual aspect. They're, they're acting like it isn't there. And then without that, there is no, there, there is no reason. If you, if you look at the way people, if people think... Um, Evolution, you know, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution, it says uh, natural selection, survival of the fittest. Why should, we, why should people be moral if that's what you believe? That we are just mind and body, and, there is, and we're just a result of, of processes that were undirected over millions of years. Why shouldn't, why, why shouldn't you do something bad to somebody? What's the, what's, the, what's the cause, what's the basis of your morality? I mean, there's, and not to say that atheists aren't moral. There, there's plenty of moral atheists out there, but it doesn't, they don't really have a, a solid basis for their morality. Their, their morality is, is self-imposed. And, 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 and the thing is, when, when the situations of life come, up, come, come weighing on a person, that's when the, you need a basis for your morality. Because when, when every, you know, like in a Katrina or some kind of natural disaster, you know, if you, if you don't have a basis for morality, your morality will go out the door and you will do things like an animal and it's been proven, it's been seen. If you have a spiritual basis, if you acknowledge your spirit and you acknowledge that, that you are not just a, a, uh, an accident of natural selection and survival of the fittest, that you are actually a created being that's, 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 that's created by God with an intrinsic value and all, all, everybody else has value. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a spiritual aspect of humanity. The sanctity of life, you know, it's, it's people who believe that we have a spirit that push for, for life. You know, they push for, to, to get rid of abortion because they believe every person has worth. Now, if you, if you think it's just that we're just um, time and chance and matter, then, there, then people don't have worth and it might as well kill, kill people, kill old people, kill babies, kill, kill anybody that isn't producing for society. That's what would make logical sense you know, that's what the whole eugenics movement was, was about back in the, in the, in the 1930s. It was, it was kill, you know, they were sterilizing anybody who had a handicap. You know, you know, and a lot of people like, try and cover up that dark part. There's all kinds of things that happen in this country that people try and cover up and that were based off of ideologies that were, that, that were, that were denying the spiritual nature of, man, of mankind. So, to, to get to that, so, so we have the, the whole idea of living by the spirit, and living by the flesh. So, so what does it look like to live by the flesh? Let's look what it says in Galatians chapter 5. Chapter 5, starting in verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, uh, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, and I also tell you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's why I made an effort to, to include um, continuously practiced behaviors as, as part of my definition for addiction. This is something that you continuously do. This is a, this is a, a, a habit that you have. And they call it bad habits. First you make your habits, then your habits make you, right? And so 
It says those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people think that they, they've gone to church, church meetings you know, when, uh, sometime in the past and say, oh, I went up to an altar call, I'm good. And a lot of people think it's like a flu shot or, or some kind of vaccine that you get. You go up to an altar call, you say your prayer one time, and then you're, then you're good with God and you can live however you want. That's not what the Bible says. If you practice such things as selfish ambition, dissensions, sorcery, sorcery, in, in the original Greek word for, in the book of Galatians is actually the, word, the Greek word pharmakia. The, the, the word pharmakia is where we get the word pharmacy. So the whole idea of drugs comes out of that idea of sorcery that's highlighted there in the book of Galatians. And so drug use and selfish ambition, those, those are things that, 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 that are works of the flesh. And they are sin. If you practice those things, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Don't, don't let anybody deceive you into, into, into telling you that, that you can do whatever you want and God has to accept. God doesn't. It, God sent his son to die on the cross for sins. And, and those, it says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Christ w w paid for your sins and he rose from the dead, then, then you will be saved. And, it, and now, a person who's saved, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, if... Uh, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation and old things have passed away. You know, you might have heard the Bible or the song Amazing Grace. It says, you know, I, I once was lost and now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I can see. I mean, that, that, it, it's kind of painting the picture of before he knew God and then after he knew God. And I, and I just want to encourage people, if, if, you, if, you, if, you've, if you've said a prayer at a church meeting before and, and, you, and you, you believe that... that, that that you committed your life to God, but you're not seeing the Spirit move in your life. You're not seeing a change in behavior. It says that you're a new creation. You need to live as a new creation. If you're not living as a new creation, I, I, I encourage you, don't be too proud to get back on your knees and continue to seek God and ask Him to change you. God transforms people. That's the, that's the hope of the gospel, is that God really does transform people. He, do, he doesn't just kind of transform people. He really transforms people. And if he hasn't transformed you yet, don't lose hope. Just continue to get humble. I mean, it says, the Bible says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if you haven't received the grace of God, maybe there's a bunch of pride in your heart still. I mean, just check yourself. I mean, that's all I'm saying. Because I know, I know that I know that I know. I wouldn't be here right now if God had not saved me. I did not save myself. I, I, I share my testimony with guys in, in jail and in, 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 uh, in recovery homes all the time. And some of them are like, yeah, you did good. I'm like, no, I didn't do good. It wasn't about me doing good. It's about God working in me. And we got to get this. If you want to be overcomers over addiction, you got to understand that, it, that it's a spiritual thing that God does in your heart. Let's look at the second verse I have for selfishness in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each one can esteem others higher than himself. You know, there's this push in society in the, in the psycho psychological arena that you need to have good, high, you know, you have to have high self-esteem. The better your self-esteem is, the more better, the better you will do in this world. And I tell you, that's contrary to what the Bible says right there, right? It says you need to, in lowliness of mind, let others, um, let each esteem others higher, better than himself. So what does that look like? I mean, so, so it looks you consider other people and, and you don't consider yourself above anybody else. In, instead, you esteem them higher. You respect other people. And you, instead of always trying to build your self-respect and trying to, and try, I got to do me. No, you don't have to do you. You need to, you need to get into Christ. <laughs> you, need to, you, need to, you need to die to yourself. You need to let nothing be done out of selfish ambition. A lot of people think, that, oh, I have this addiction. I heard somebody went to church and got set free from the addiction. And they want to use the, the church thing as a tool. And, and I'm, I'm going to get to that in a little while. So, let's, so that, that was Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. And then the second thing I wanted to highlight about um, addiction, it's idolatry. <laughs> That's what addiction is. And what's idolatry? You know, you've seen American Idol. Is that idolatry? Some would say that it might be. But, but idolatry is when we worship, when you, an idol is a false god. You know, like you, you carve something out of, a, uh, out of a piece of wood, you put it up on a shelf and you worship that thing. That's idolatry. 
when, when, or you, you have anything that you raise above the level of God, if you look at yourself in the mirror and you're worshiping your body and you're worshiping yourself, that's idolatry. If, you, if you're polishing your car and get, getting your car all clean all the time and just like worshiping that car, that's idolatry. You know, when, when I was in, uh, uh, in the midst of my addiction, I, um, I really, really enjoyed crystal meth. And, and sometimes we would just look at it and it would almost be to a point where you were idol idolizing the, 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 the shininess of the crystals and things like that. And it's nothing, you know, even jewelry. People, you know, people will worship jewelry, want to look at that bling all the time. That's idolatry. And so what does it say uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Now this is a, this is a key verse for, for dealing with addiction in general. I mean, this is, this is a, a very powerful verse. And let's see how it connects to idolatry. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 13. So, um, actually, let's start in verse 12, right? First uh, Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let me read that again. If you think you're sta if, the if you think you're standing, if you think you're all good, take heed lest you fall. In verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except which is common to man. Amen? No temptation that we've ever dealt with is, is, is new. It's like, oh, you don't know what I'm dealing with. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's happened before. Everybody's been tempted according to the lust. It's the way we were created. There's nothing new under the sun. So this is, this, all the temptations that we face are common. Somebody else is struggling with, with whatever you're struggling with right now, right? And then I love what it says right there, though. But God is faithful. Amen. <laughs> he is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. And a lot of people will misquote this verse and say, oh, God won't give me anything more than I can handle. That's not what the verse says. He says he won't let us be tempted beyond what we are able. He, and, and what does it say there? But with every with the temptation, he will also make a way of escape. So God will let us get into situations that we can't handle all the time. It happens all the time. And I believe one of the reasons why we get into situations we can't handle is that, so that we turn to God and say, God, I can't handle this. And a lot of times, if, if God sees us walking in pride, he'll let his hands off our life. And he'll let us walk into a situation that, God, how did I get here? I can't handle this. Well, you should have been paying attention to me. And now, now, now thank you for talking to me, even though you were ignoring me a little while ago. <laughs> and I think that's what God says when we get into these situations. And when, when, when we don't, when we kind of, it, just think about a relationship. I mean, if, if we're in a relationship with the creator God, and, but we, we you know, he, and he pours out his love and his grace and his mercy on us, and he blesses us with things, but then we ignore him. We act like he, he doesn't matter to us. You know, it's so often I see people who, who commit, the, who have said the prayer, who love, love God, but then they, then they just get puffed up and they walk a life like God doesn't matter to them. And then they want, and then I hear them, you know, then, then I hear that the bad things happen in their, in their life. And some people say, well, God doesn't bring anything bad into people's life. I, I would say people bring bad things into their own life because they ignore God. Amen. And so you, he says, it says that he will give you a way of escape out of every temptation. So what's that way of escape? And I, I didn't put it in the notes here, but let, let's just go to uh, Matthew chapter 4. Let me show you a, a way of escape that's available to everybody. And Jesus himself use it, uses it in Matthew chapter 4. And so it, it says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit in Matthew chapter 4, four verse 1 into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The devil himself is going to tempt Jesus. And, he, and, and, and Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And afterward, he was hungry. <laughs> I'd be pretty hungry after 40 days, right? And there, now then, now when the tempter had came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And this is, how, this is, this is what's available to everyone. When we are tempted by the devil, we should do what Jesus did. That's why he came down and lived, with, lived on this planet for 33 years, so he could show us what to do. And what does Jesus do in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4? But he answered and said, It is written, You shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so what did Jesus do when he was tempted? He quoted the scripture. He, quoted, he, he used the sword of the Spirit. He used the Bible to, 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 to counteract the effects of the tempter. So, so when, now if you go back to 1 Corinthians 10, 
It says, God is faithful, who will, who will not allow you to be tempted what you are able, but with, with the temptation will also make a way of escape. That way of escape is the word of God. You use the word of God. When I was first uh, getting out of the addiction to crystal meth, there would be times where my mind would go places where I wouldn't want it to go, and it would start thinking about crystal meth. And I would use the word of God. I would memorize scripture, and so that thought would be in my head, and then say, I, I would take hold of that thought and say, no, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, was, it's, that's my life verse. So I would re recite that verse in my head over and over. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. I would say that over and over. And each time I would say that verse in my head over and over, those thoughts, those temptations of the sin that I was ensnared in would go away. And, and, and so that's how we, that's the, that's the way of escape that God has given us. He has provided us with a sword of the spirit, a way to do battle. When the, when the spiritual temptation comes into your life, you've got to get the word of God. You've got to have bullets in your gun. The more, the more I, call, I consider the more um, verses that you memorize, that you have in your heart, the more ammo you have in the spiritual battle. Amen? So the next verse I have is Colossians 3.5 that, that talks about idolatry, right? No, oh, actually, wait, I didn't finish the... Uh, it, I, didn't, I didn't finish 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. It says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Right after he was talking about the temptations, he said, flee for, from idolatry. So it's all connected in there, in, 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 the, in the whole thing. So let's, but let's go to Colossians now. Colossians 3, 5. So this is, this is and the book of Colossians is great too. It gives clear uh, instruction to Christians. This is what you should do. What does it say in, in 3 5? Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, covetousness which is idolatry. Covetousness, that's, that's just, that's just um, wanting stuff that isn't, you know, coveting stuff. When you, when you look at something awesome, you ever see a nice you know, Ferrari or something awesome, you know, driving down the road? And you, you want that? If you wanted a Ferrari that you saw, that would be coveting a Ferrari. If you saw somebody with a nice watch and you're like, oh, I want one of those, that's coveting that watch. So avoid covetousness, which is idolatry. And that's, that, that's what I'm talking about when addictions are idolatry. When we're, look, when we're addicted to this thing and we raise it above God, it's that we need to avoid coveting and we, we need to avoid idolatry. And then the third thing I highlighted about addiction is slavery. Addiction is a form of slavery. If we are in an addiction, we are a slave to that addiction. Let's go to Matthew chapter, or actually not Matthew, John chapter 8, verse 34. John chapter 8, verse 34. This is an awesome piece of scripture, and the context is Jesus was talking to some Jewish people, and he, and he was kind of trying to, con or he was doing he was communicating the gospel to them. He was communicating the truth of God to the Jewish people. And, uh, and so the, the, the subtitle I have in my Bible, it says, Jesus speaks about God's true children. And I'm just going to go ahead and read from verse, um, verse 31 all the way to verse 36. Amen. So verse 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that was the, the highlighted verse I put at the top of the notes. Uh, John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered, uh, in verse 33 it says, They answered uh, Jesus, him, and we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage to anyone, which is... Clearly, they don't even know their own history. How can you say you, you will be made free? And Jesus uh, answered them in verse 34. He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not ab abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, then you shall be free indeed. Amen? Amen. So, so we need to understand, if you're in sin, if you're in the sin of idolatry, worshiping this thing, then you're a slave to sin. And you need to be set free. So, uh, and, and let's, let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 6, to kind of back up that point. And then we'll, then we'll get into the solution. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says, Knowing this, that your old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. See, this is what we're, we, he's talking about Christ going to the cross and knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ on the cross, that the body of sin might be done away with. So he, you know, in the book of Romans, it talks all the time about how, how transformational the, 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 the act of salvation is. It's not just a religious thing that you do and check off on your list. Oh, I did that thing. I got baptized. Check. I, got, I, I, I said a prayer. Check. You know, I mean, no, that's not what it, he, he says. It, it actually impacts your life. It changes the way you live. And if it's not changing the way you live, then, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> then, you're, then there's something you're missing. Amen? So, so that we should not be slaves of sin. We should be free from sin. We should have ability. Not to say that a Christian does not sin anymore. I'm not saying that. Please don't get, me, get, get it messed up. A Christian still, I mean, it, it, there's three parts to salvation. There's justification, sanctification, and glorification. What does that mean? It says you're, the Bible says that you're justified by faith. As soon as you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He went to the cross for your sins, and you confess it with your mouth, and you believe it in your heart, you're saved, you're justified by faith. But then it talks about the sanctification process throughout the life of a Christian. And so, so the Spirit of God comes to live inside of us, and, and, and as we grow in the Lord, we should be sanctified continually. You sh your Christian walk should look like an upward, uh, an upward climb. You, know, you might fall down a little bit, but, but you've got to continue to move upward because you commit your life to Christ, you're justified by faith, and then you're sanctified through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like your relationship to, cha to sin changes. It doesn't say you don't, you don't sin anymore, but when you do sin as a Christian, it should bother you. And, that, and that's the first thing I noticed. You know, I, I wish I could say I committed my life to Christ and I never touched drugs again. No, for a time, after, I, after I, the first time I committed my life to Christ, I went back to that world for a while and it was messed up. It was hurting my heart living in that lifestyle. So, so it doesn't mean that, you're, that, that, that you, you didn't truly commit your life to Christ if, if, you, if you sin again. I mean, everybody sins. If you say you have no, the Bible says if you say you don't have sin, you're a liar. <laughs> You're sinning in that. Yeah, everyone has sin, but, it, but it's a, it's a, your relationship to, to sin should change if you've been saved. If you, if you have a relationship to God, your relationship to, cha to sin should, should change. And as you grow closer to God, you should grow further away from sin. And, and you should be free. You should be, the, more, the more truth you have in your life, the more God you have in your life, the more freedom you should have. You should feel that you're not oppressed by that. You're not tempted by that. I'm not tempted by the same things I used to be tempted by nine years ago. Amen? Amen. And so how do we overcome addiction? You know, and, and, I, and, I, and I tried to keep it pretty simple. How do we overcome addiction? This is how I have overcome a, a, the addictions that I struggle with in my life, and I'm still, and this is how I'm continuing to do it. And, I, and I'm, I'm continuing to press the point that this is not a religious thing that you need to check off, that, that it's just some, you know, you, you, want, you want me to describe how you can do it so you can go and use it as a tool. Now, this is a relational thing. This is a blueprint, kind of an, uh, some advice that I'm giving you, that, uh, or just, just a testimony of what I've done in my life. And I encourage you, if you're struggling with addiction, you should, tr you should do these two things. Now, let's, let's first, before we, we do these two things, let's read what it says in the book of Mark. And it talks about when Jesus first started. In the book of Mark, the first thing that Jesus said, so you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. And in the book of Mark, chapter 1, it talks about when Jesus first came on the scene. You know, he, he, was, he was a carpenter's son. He lived his whole life. And then he started his ministry. He started to go around and preach. And this is what the first thing it says in the book of Mark. Verse 14, it says, Now after John, he's talking about John the Baptist. I don't know if you've heard of John the Baptist, but John the Baptist was this guy, the forerunner, they called him. He would just go and preach about the, the Messiah would come and, and, and set, us, set us free from sins. He, and and when, when John the Baptist first saw Jesus, he pointed and said, Look, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so um, now after John, John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel and of the kingdom of God. In verse 15 it says, and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now repent 
and believe the gospel. And I believe that's all you got to do to overcome addiction in your life. You need to continue, but just don't just repent once, but continually repent and continually believe. And you and you can every day if you have to get up, wake up, repent and believe. And and as you start moving towards God, God will set you free. So, um, repent means to change your mind. The original, the the actual word in Greek, is, the literal meaning of the word is to change your mind. So, if you are addicted to alcohol, a person who's addicted to alcohol looks at alcohol and says, that looks good. Now, a person who repents looks at alcohol and says, I hate that. I hate that thing. You change your mind. You change the way you look at that alcohol. And, it's a, and that's, that's what repentance is. You, you're changing the, the, the view and you're turning from it. He said, I'm not going there. I, I, I can't stand that. It, I'm, I'm done with that thing. And, that, and that's what repentance is. It's a, it's a turning away from the thing that you're addicted to. And so, so if we want to overcome addiction, we need to repent. And then it says, believe the gospel. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means, that means God is available to us right now. The Spirit of God is available to us right now. And so, so we need to believe the gospel. And so um, let's, let's look at the two verses I highlighted for this. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts in the New Testament. Acts chapter... So Acts chapter 3, now in the book of Acts, now the, the, the four gospels are the life of Jesus told by four different angles. The book of Acts is the beginning of the church. And so the apostle Peter and the apostle Paul, that's what that's what's all described in the book of Acts. And so they're starting the church and they're going out there and they're preaching the gospel. So in the book of Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, says and this is what Peter says, he says, uh, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, that, uh, so, the times, uh, so that times of refreshing may come to the presence, uh, may come from the presence of the Lord. So that, that's, that's Peter preaching out the gospel. Um, he's, he's telling them what they, shall, they, what they must do to be saved. And he says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. So that, uh, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And, and, and so that's, that's kind of what it does when you repent. It opens the door for a time of refreshing from God. And, and, and a lot of people kind of, you know, they, they think of uh, street preachers, you know, con condemning people. They, when they hear the word repent, oh, a lot of people, there's some churches that don't even, don't even say the word repent. They're so scared of it. And, and, and we need to not be afraid of the word repent. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to turn from sin. It's a good thing to change our mind about the things that, that, that destroy us. It's a good thing to get humble before God. And, and we need to run towards repentance instead of away from it. We need to understand we, sh we should feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit in our heart. And then we should, that should draw us to repentance. And it's a, it's a joyous thing. It gives, opens the door for refreshing. I mean, I know there's times when I do things that aren't pleasing to God. And I just get on my knees and I, and I, and I repent. I say, that, Lord, I know what I've done is wrong. I know that, that, that you, your son paid for that sin on the cross. I pray that you would transform me. Amen? So that's what it looks like. To, and then uh, uh, the, the most uh, beautiful image of what it looks like to, to repent. How do I actually do it? Okay, what does it look like to repent? Psalm 51 is the best example of what it looks like to actually repent. I mean, it, it's, if you could write it down, this is what it would look like to repent. So if you go to the Psalm 51, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to highlight some parts of it. But this was a psalm. This is like a song or this is a kind of a poem written or a prayer basically written by David. King David, you've heard of David and Goliath. Well, this is that David. And he sinned. He actually he actually committed adultery and then he killed the husband. He sent the husband of the, person, of the woman that he committed adultery with to the front lines and had him killed. So he committed murder and adultery. And so one of the prophets of God came to him as a king and said, you, you have sinned before the Lord. I mean, there's, a, there's an awesome little story on how, that, how, the, how the prophet tells him, but we'll get to that some other time. But, uh, so, but after the, the prophet tells David what he did, David, 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 like, whoa, he backs up and says, all right, I, I've messed up. I've, I've sinned before God. 
God's wrath is going to fall upon me. And actually, because the, the woman that he had committed adultery with got pregnant. And, and, and David had this thing. He, he loved children, but, and, and he was hoping for that child. And that child died in childbirth. And, and the Lord said, I'm taking that child. You're not, you're, you're not going to have that child. And so when that child died, that's when David wrote this. Because this, his sin had, had, had come, up, come, come up to his, uh, I mean, to his heart and, and just weighed on him. And so in verse 1 of Psalm 51, it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. See, see, David is just, he, he's, he's confessing to God. He, he knows that God saw what he, saw what he did. And verse 3, he says, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me. And against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. God wants us to be honest with him when we sin. He wants us to be, be uh, not to try and hide it and try and run from him. Just be real. He says... Uh, and in, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. And then, and then so in verse 7, he says, Purge me with hyssop. It's kind of something they used to use to wash clothes, I think. And then I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. And verse 10 is, the, is like the, the, my favorite part of it. This is what David tells God. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. In verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation that, uh, and uphold me by your righteous spirit, or your um, generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. So that's, that's, that's verses 1 through 13 of, of, of Psalm 51. And it's, it's, I used to read that psalm over and over again. I used to, I mean, I used to fast and just pray that psalm over and over again because I wanted to, to, to pour out my heart that way to God because my sin was real to me. I realized how much of a sinner I was and I would just, I would just pray that, create in me a clean heart. You know, renew a steadfast spirit with me. Don't transform me, God, into a person that's not a sinner. Then I will, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you if you transform me, Lord. And I, I would pray that over and over. And I, I believe that God has heard those prayers and I believe he'll hear that, hear that prayer for you too if you get into Psalm 51. If you know that you've sinned, you know that you've, you've lived a life that's outside of what God wants for you. Get Psalm 51 into your heart and, 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 just, and just pray it out to God. And say, Lord, that's, that's what I want. I want a clean, clean heart. I want a steadfast spirit that, that's not going to run from you. You know, transform me into that. Amen? So, and then the second part, your first part is repenting, like Psalm 51. And the second part is believe the gospel. And so we've heard that, you know, gospel music, gospel this, gospel that. What is the word gospel? The word gospel means good news. So we need to believe the good news. And what's, what's the good news? Let's go to John chapter 3. It pretty much highlights the good news. And we need to know the good news. And we need to, we need to think about the good news. And it needs to be just not something that's common to us. We need to get into this thing. The good news says in John chapter 3, um, we're going to start in verse 15. It says, Whoever believes in him, uh, or you know, in him meaning Jesus, should not perish but have eternal life. In John 3, 16, we've all heard, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in verse 17, it really highlights the good news. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but, but that the world uh, through him might be saved. God did not send Jesus to the cross so that people can be condemned. He sent Jesus to the cross so that we might be saved. And that's the good news. Even though we've sinned, even though we've told lies, even though we've probably stolen something, even though we've committed adultery, we've done all these things, God has sent his son into the world that we might be saved. If, that if we believe in him, all of our sins will be forgiven. And if we look to him, we will, we will have eternal life. So that's the good news. The good news is that you're not condemned by your sin. You're forgiven of your sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you need to know that. You need to be rejoiced over that. It should, be, it should make you just happy to know that God loves you that much, that he would send his son that was in heaven 
all the way to earth to become a man. You know, if you're a God sitting in heaven and you and you it's in say if I created a little two-dimensional person, I, I drew him on paper, and that was my creation. A little tiny two-dimensional person. And 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 I created a whole world of them, but, but it, you know the whole world just fits in a little a whole world of tiny little two-dimensional people. And here I am, a three-dimensional person, and I'm but and I care about them so much that I'm going to humble myself to come out of the three dimensions. And I'm going to go down to, to two dimensions, you know, <laughs> and you and you're just going to humble yourself to get down on their level. And when you get down there, they 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 insult you, they spit on you, they 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 crucify you. But you do that so that you can have a relationship with them. That's the gospel. You got to understand that God did this so we can be connected to Him, and we need to believe that. If you want to be set free from addiction. If you, want to be, uh, if you want to know what it is to truly live, then you need to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And what does it say in the book of Ephesians? The book of Ephesians is an awesome book. It tells all, all what, you know, pretty much everything you need to know about being a Christian is in the book of Ephesians. I mean, you, you could have the book of Ephesians and the book of Romans, and you pretty much, you, you'd have everything you needed. But in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, starting in verse 4, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us um, even when we were dead in trespasses. You know, it says it right there. He loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace have we been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places with Christ. That, that in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's, that's awesome, isn't it? <laughs> it says, for by grace have you been saved through faith. Not of, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works that anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared good works for us to do. God has a plan for your life and it's to do good works. It says it right there. He prepared them for you to do. And, and, and he, he did this even while you were still a sinner. God had a plan for you. He wants to use your life. And it says it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. That, that, that he gives us this grace, he gives us this faith. It's a gift of God that we can't boast. He can't say, oh, look how good of a Christian I am. No, you can't say that. You're only a Christian because God made you a Christian. God saved you. <laughs> by grace have you been saved. If it, if it was by works or by anything you did, it wouldn't be by grace. You couldn't say by grace alone. It's by grace alone, amen? So, and, and then I just wanted to, to make a few comments about this whole thing concerning addiction. Um, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not the only way to overcome addiction. It's not the only way. You can, you can, I, I know people that used to do crystal meth with me that don't do crystal meth anymore, because, and, and it's not because they became a Christian. They just stopped doing crystal meth. Some of them went to prison. They got out. They didn't go back to it. They got a job. They did, did, did. A lot of them switched from crystal meth to alcohol, <laughs> and since it's legal, they feel they've been, you know, they're free from the addiction they had. But a lot of people just switch addictions from one thing to the other. But you don't need Jesus Christ to get set free from addiction. You can go to a 12-step program. Um, you, can, you can just do it on your own willpower. You can go to secular treatment programs. You can go you know, and try and find some other way. And, and, and if all you want to do is get set free from an addiction, if that's your goal in life, you don't need Jesus Christ to do that. I, I'm not going to tell you that that's the only way you're going to get set free from an addiction because that's not what the gospel is, ba of, is about. The gospel is, is the only way to have peace with God and be saved. That's the only way is, is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you're going to have peace with God and be saved. Now, if you are saved and you do have peace with God, you will be set free from sin. And, and with that sin comes the addictions in your life. And, and you will have eternal life. And you will, and you will have this, uh, you know, what I've experienced is you will have life like you never dreamed it. You know, the, the life I've lived over the past nine years, has, it was not anything I would have imagined 20 years ago. <laughs> I was thinking totally different thoughts for my life. But God has, has a plan for your life that's better than anything you could imagine. And so, so I, don't, I, would, I would hope that people wouldn't just come to, to Christ to try and get over something to build their own kingdom. It's not about, oh, I just want to get over this addiction so I can do my thing. Well, then you probably don't want to come 
to an, a Christian addiction thing, you, you can go and find somewhere else to do that. If you want to come to Christ and you want to see what it is to be set free from sin and live a totally transformed life and know what you're founded on, know what you believe, and, and let those beliefs transform you and, and transform your family and, and, and inspire people in this world, then you want to come to Christ. If you don't want to do that, if you've got your own plans, then, 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 then the world is full of all kinds of stuff you can go to. But I would encourage you to seek Christ. And, 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 and to be saved and to live a life that's transformed by God, trusting in his ability to, to do what you can't. That's what I've seen, and, that, and that's what's uh, beautiful to me. That's what gives me hope. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for your, your grace that, that, that comes and saves us. And I, pr I pray that you would, anybody who would hear this message that is in the middle of an addiction would consider you, Lord, that, that they would be drawn by your spirit and they would, get, they would be willing to repent and turn from those things and turn to you, that the, and, and that, you would, um, that you would pull them out of that, that you would give them the truth and they would be set free, free by it, that they would live transformed lives, that they would spread your gospel and build your kingdom through this world. And I thank you for what you've done in my life and, and I pray for all those that are, that are out there in the darkness, Lord. I pray that you would shine a light and, and that you would use... Um, this church and this ministry to do it, Lord. Whatever your will, will is, that, that's what I pray for, for me, this church, and anybody who hears this. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.